hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail and uh, I have a very special guest on today because he's going to be talking about something very, very important, uh, a very important environmental issue. His name is John Jablonski and he is Executive Director of the Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy. Thank you for coming on, John. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here, Gail. Oh, you're welcome. You're more than welcome. Um, let's start out with you giving us a little bit of the history of um, the Watershed Conservancy in our area. Well, several of us were attending meetings, meet, meetings in the 1980s over uh, controversy over herbicide use back at that time. And um, at that time, I think they were using herbicides on over 500 acres of Chautauqua Lake. Ew. And we felt that uh, the root causes were not being addressed. Mm -hmm. The lake was being fed with a lot of sediment from the watershed. Uh, people were you know, indiscriminately fertilizing their lawns. There was no care taken when properties were developed to control the erosion. Uh, and we saw a lot of destruction of the lakeshore forests that were left, a lot of loss of habitat. So uh, we tried to get the county to address the root causes of what grows the algae and what grows the plants in the lake. And uh, we couldn't make any headway <laughs> uh -oh. with the elected officials back in the late 80s. Uh, so those of us who kept speaking out about the need for preventative activities decided to form the Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy. Oh, that's good. So you were one of the founders then? Yes, Becky Nystrom, who was a Jamestown Community College biology professor, and I formed the organization. It was incorporated in 1990. Oh, okay. Are, are you a 501c3? We are a 501c3 public charity, so mm -hmm. donations may be tax deductible to our organization. So we've been here for 31 years. Wow, wow, that's great. I didn't realize it had been, you'd been active that way for so long, but I'm glad to hear it though. Um, now, for people in the viewing audience, especially since this can be seen on a, website, a certain website, um, that are not around here, would you uh, tell, describe to the viewing audience what a watershed is? A watershed is a basin. So if you think of a bathtub, with the drain being the, the waterway where the water goes out, if you consider the entire bathtub is the watershed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a drainage basin with a lake or a stream at the bottom of it. Oh, okay. So the Chautauqua County watershed covers the entire county, right? I mean, we have We have multiple watersheds in the county and we've got a really neat geologic feature in that just a probably within a mile of where we're sitting is the continental divide between the Gulf of Mexico and the Great Lakes and the Eastern Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, now that's partway between Westfield and Mayville, right? It's just up the road from here. Just up the road. And, and legend yeah. has it that there's a barn that on one side of the, the water off one side of the roof flows to Lake Erie and the water off the other side of the roof flows to the Gulf of Mexico. Oh. I don't know if that's true or if that barn's still yeah. there, but. That's the top of the, the top of the Continental Divide. So I, Chautauqua I, Lake flows to the Mississippi River and Chautauqua Creek flows to Lake Erie and to the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, I, I know that there's a, a spot on, as you're taking the Portage Road from Mayville to Westfield, where um, on a snowy day, it, it, it will be a lot worse on the Mayville end, then after you get past that continental divide. Yes. So they call it the snow ridge. Yep. Or the escarpment. Yes. Yes. Okay, what is your mission then? Um, you maybe have a mission statement? We, we do, it's to preserve and enhance the water quality, scenic beauty and ecological health of the lakes, streams and watersheds of the Chautauqua region. So we are a countywide organization. Uh, we're not just a Chautauqua Lake organization. We work to conserve the best habitats and conserve the landscapes and the water quality across all the waters and landscapes of our county. Oh, good, good. Okay, um, now uh, you mentioned, now how do you help homeowners, businesses, and municipalities 
How do you help these people uh, to protect the land that acts as a vital filter to stop sediment and harmful pollutants from reaching streams, rivers, and lakes? Well, we work two major ways. Uh, one way is we have a lakescapes program and we have a conservationist who goes out to people's homes and meets with landowners and can assist in advising on what kind of plants to plant. Uh, we recommend that people have a naturally vegetated buffer strip between their yards and waterways, mm -hmm. whether it's Chautauqua Lake or Chautauqua mm -hmm. Creek or uh, you know, other streams that you have a natural area providing a glove over that waterway mm -hmm. so that anything coming from your yard is filtered before it gets to that waterway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Carol Markham, our conservationist, has provided assistance to about 230 families over the past two years. And uh, you know, the demand is strong and uh, we provided that service primarily in the Chautauqua Lake watershed and we hope to expand that to, to all the lake watersheds in, in coming years. Mm -hmm. I, I know somebody uh, who does organic gardening who comes on Fresh Perspectives from time to time and he talks about how some of his neighbors use toxic products on their property that runs downhill into a stream uh, on or near his property and he's had a couple of different dogs of his. Uh, and you know when the dogs are out running around they're not thinking about whether something's <laughs> poisonous or not. And uh, a couple of different dogs that he's had have come down with lymphomas. Oh boy. Yeah, so he, a, figures, he figures that's how Yes, there is a link between lawn care chemicals and uh, lymphoma in dogs. That is pretty mm -hmm. well documented now. Oh good, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, now, um, you uh, have some property, uh, one of your watersheds is near the end of Lyons Road along the Chautauqua Gorge there. Um, would you like to tell us about that? Sure. Uh, Jay Stratton, who is a part year resident of Westfield, who grew up in Westfield, has donated two properties to the Conservancy as nature preserves. Uh, one is on uh, Lyons Road and it starts on Lyons Road and runs down to to Chautauqua Creek and it's a very beautiful area. It's about 23 acres and uh, we have trails there and uh, it's a beautiful place. You can't get to it in the wintertime because they don't plow the road but oh, probably. it's a wonderful place in the spring <laughs> yeah, to, uh, yeah. to look for wildflowers and it's a wonderful place to take a walk and yeah. waddle in the stream. Well you could <laughs> probably go over to it on snowshoes or, or yes. something. <laughs> um, I guess some of the pictures that we scanned for you uh, were at that watershed. Yes, several of they? them were at that, which we call the Chautauqua Creek Oxbow Preserve. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we I've only been over to see it once, but it was like an early an early May day. It was a picture perfect day. The weather it was sunny. It was not hot not too hot to go for a walk. It wasn't a cold day. It was just that perfect temperature that you rarely ever get. And I remember it, it was so beautiful. It was right, um, now there, you know what ramps are. Mm -hmm. And for those of you in the viewing audience that don't know, it's the thing that a lot of you refer to as leaks. And I remember when we were walking through there that day, uh, that pro piece of property was completely carpeted with ramps. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of ramps in the <laughs> Chautauqua Gorge area. <laughs> yeah. And if you step on them, you can smell them. <laughs> That's right. I was just going to say that because they seem to be in the pathways and everything. So as we were walking along that, that really a beautiful aroma kept coming up that we got to smell. I know some people don't like the smell, but we do. And, uh, I'm, you know, like out where we live in our own neighborhood, we go out and dig some up every year yeah. and, and we love them, actually. Well, I guess, um, okay, I guess we'll show uh, some of those pictures now then. 
Yeah, that's upstream. That's at the Beaver Swamp, which is upstream on Chautauqua Creek. That's a beaver pond that is tributary to Chautauqua Creek. Yeah, that is really, that is a really beautiful piece of scenery. And that's actually adjacent to the Chautauqua uh, Rails to Trails oh. up there. It backs up to that property between, oh. it's right off of 430, west mm -hmm. of west of Mayville. Mm -hmm. So it's just west of here. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the wildflowers in the, uh, down in the uh, gorge area. Now, do you know what the names of those two kinds of flowers are? Uh, the flower are? on the right is cardinal flower. Cardinal flower? Yes. Those are both native flowers. I'm not sure what the flower is on the left. Mm -hmm. But they're native flowers. Yes, those are native flowers that are in the preserve. Beautiful colors. Oh, well, that's definitely in the gorge. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's on the uh, Oxbow Preserve. Yeah, that can be kind of very slippery to walk <laughs> on, uh, can't it? it? Yes, it sure can. That, that shale is. It can be very dangerous. You've got to be very careful. Yeah. <laughs> That's another picture at the down in the preserve. And there's a group of people. Are those some of the other people? Yes, from that's, the watershed. That was a uh, an organized organized uh, tour that we had. We hold tours there usually uh, one, about well, once a year, once every other year at that preserve. But it is open to the public from sunrise to sunset. Mm -hmm. And it's you know it's cooler. That's a picture of Jay Stratton on the left who donated the land to us, and Becky Nystrom, our current president and co-founder mm -hmm. of the Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy down in the, in the gorge, in the, in the base of the property. Oh, yeah. It's so nice to hear the sound of the water when you're, when you're down there, too. It's wonderful down there, and it's, you know, in the summertime, it's cooler than above. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. In the spring and fall, it's just, yeah. it's, it's one of the most beautiful places in the county. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Were there any more pictures? I'm thinking. They're all of something else. What did he say? <laughs> They're all of something else. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, now, how does what you do with the property uh, help to protect the watershed? How does that work? Well, the, we try to pick properties that either provide important wildlife habitat or protect water quality. And those preserves on Chautauqua Creek are actually upstream of the Village of Westfield Water Department's water intake. Mm -hmm. So one way of keeping water clean is to keep it in forest. So as much, as, as much land we can keep in forest um, protects the water quality for those of us who drink it downstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have is two properties on Chautauqua Creek, which augment the lands that are owned by the Village of Westfield in their watershed, their watershed lands above their intake. So the more of the f more of that watershed we protect and keep in forest land, the cleaner the water is that is consumed by the people of the Village of Westfield and town of Westfield who are part of that system. Oh yeah, you know what I've read? Um, I've read that um, plants are the best water filtering system that there is. That's, that's true, and it's often said that, you know, that, that tree is the best water, a tree is the best water quality tool we have. Good. And it's actually been proven that the more land that's enforced in a watershed, the cheaper it is for municipality to treat that water for human consumption. So there's a direct, direct link between how clean the water is and how much forest there is in a, in a watershed. So, so globally, um, you know, both public and private water suppliers and even, even large uh, beverage companies are now purchasing and working with organizations to purchase and protect large acreages of lands in their watershed to protect the water quality for communities and for, for the industries that depend upon clean mm -hmm. water for their, for their beverage processing mm -hmm. or food processing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we look at that, we, we look at Chautauqua Lake, for instance, uh, you want to keep the forest, you want to keep 70% at least of the, of the watershed in forest in order to maintain the water quality of that water body downstream. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. We, 
uh, trees are very important. Um, I know that um, I've heard that uh, more than 70% of the um, rainforest has been cut down for grazing cattle, and we really need those trees. We do, and you know, if we can, in our area, if we can keep the trees intact and the streams can hold trout, then we're gonna have clean water going into our lakes. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not only does keeping the trees help the fish, it then helps, you know, it helps humans for recreational purposes oh, and yeah. cuts down on the oh, problems yeah. we, we have in our lakes. Yep. Now, I've been going through, um, I've been cutting out newspaper articles, and that's how I help myself get ideas uh, for questions to ask you. And this one article um, that I ran across is called, Don't Believe Everything You Hear About Chautauqua Lake. And it's written by a lady named Melanie Smith, who is the chair of the Chautauqua Conewago Consortium, a Waterkeeper Alliance affiliate. And you said you know her. Yes. Yeah. So anyways, um, I'm going to move along to uh, the questions. Um, misconception number one is herbis, uh, this is a misconception now, herbicide treatments reduce plant growth and the harmful algal blooms that occur in the lake. Now, how does the herbicide treatments affect the plants really? Well, herbicides generally, there's, there's different kinds of herbicides. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are defoliants, so they, the chemical touches the plant's leaves and the leaves die and fall off. Others are systemic, they go through the whole, they are taken into the roots and kill the plant from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with herbicides is they are not as selective as they're purported to be by the people who promote them. Mm -hmm. And for instance, uh, several hundred acres of Aquathol K was used last summer on Chautauqua Lake to address an early season plant called curly leaf pondweed. Well, that one pondweed which came from Eurasia is viewed as a nuisance because it grows to the surface early in the season and interferes with people boating and clogs the lake around docks. Uh, but that's just one of probably 13 or 14 different pondweeds that live in Chautauqua Lake, which provide very beneficial habitat for young of the year fish and breeding habitat, spawning habitat for a lot of fish. And that chemical doesn't just select the one that's the problem, it kills, them, kills most of them. Oh, so yeah. uh, we end up, when herbicides are used, it doesn't just kill the targeted nuisance species that came over from Eurasia, it kills many other species with it. And um, there's a tendency for herbicides to make the lake less diverse in its plant community. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that when herbicides are used on a large scale repeatedly that you cut down on the number of native plants in the community and that makes the whole system less stable and more likely to have problems that are harder to control over time. Yeah, and then uh, how does it, uh, it really does, it, according to this article, it really doesn't prevent algal and cyanobacteria blooms in the lake. Well, Herbicides really don't have anything to do with the algae blooms. However, um, it's the nutrients in the water that fuel the algae blooms. And if you, the plants compete with the algae for those nutrients, and if you take too many of the plants out, there's more nutrients available for the algae. Okay. And um, you know, I've seen, I've been out on Chautauqua Lake in the summertime when you're over plant beds in Mayville and the water is almost perfectly clear. You can see almost down to the bottom in 10 feet of water. And as soon as you get out of that, that those plant beds, the water is green like pea soup. Oh, okay. So the plants are actually interacting to uh, absorb the nutrients and competing with the, uh, with the algae. And in some cases, even putting out chemicals that 
that uh, interfere with the algae growing. Oh. So, mm -hmm. um, situation on, um, on Juanita Lake about 10 years ago where they, they used herbicides in the entire lake and they, they killed too many plants and the lake was uh, overrun with algae for, for oh. the next couple of years after that oh. because they had used too many herbicides and um, they tipped the balance of the lake from being a, a plant-based ecology community, ecological community to an algae-based community. And that's, that's something you have to be very careful of uh, in, in lake and pond management. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so anyways, um, we'll go on to misconception number two. This says herbicides are selective for invasive plants only. And um, do the herbicides used in Chautauqua Lake also kill beneficial native plants? Yes, that's, yes, the aquathol K kills most of the pond weeds, not just the one that's, mm -hmm. the one that's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, fishermen love to find beds of pond weed to fish, and if they're not there, uh, the fish don't have the right cover they need to grow and survive and not be eaten by larger fish. Oh, oh yeah. And some of them, um, Procellicor, which is a newer herbicide, is more selective, but it's still not completely selective to the targeted plant. Mm -hmm. Now I know that one of the um, t one of the herbicides that's used uh, in Chautauqua Lake is 2,4-D. Now, isn't that the isn't that what Agent Orange was? Um, it's not the same thing as Agent Orange. It's not. No, it's um, and but there are definite health questions about putting 2,4-D out into the environment and. Uh, 2,4-D is related to, uh, you know, to cancers in, in pets. So it's mm -hmm. not something that, that um, you know, our organization thinks should be used in a drinking, public drinking water supply. It, it, um, that's where Chita the Chautauqua Institution gets their water, yes. isn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, um, there's a couple other um, ones that were mentioned in the article. Endothol. That's and that's Aquathol K. Yes, and that's very not. It's, that's not selective at all as an herbicide. Okay, and then another one mentioned is Procella C O R. Procella core, Yes, that is more selective, and it's probably one of if if herbicides are to be used in a targeted way, that is is one of the ones that is more selective. Uh, it's a relatively new herbicide. Mm -hmm. um, and does leave more of the native plants than some of the other herbicides. Okay, now, uh, the, but they're using all three of these in Chautauqua Lake, is that correct? Uh, depends on the year and what the state oh, allows okay. them to do. Okay, okay, so um, now besides the uh, fish and like that, uh, there are apparently benefits of the native plants in the lake uh, for other wildlife, like, uh, um, gosh, uh, it said osprey and eagles and tundra swans and so forth. Well, the the aquatic plants provide a lot of food for the for the waterfowl that uh, that live here in the summertime, and also the migratory waterfowl. Uh, they eat the, the the seeds and they eat the plant parts and the uh, tubules and other things so there's a lot of food that migratory birds are dependent upon and if you use too much if you treat too many acres with herbicides you take away the food the food that's needed for these migratory birds mm -hmm. and Audubon New York has designated Chautauqua Lake as a statewide important bird area because of the you know the, the hundreds of thousands of waterfowl that pass through here each year and and birds such as the tundra swans come all the way from the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge on their way to the estuaries of the East Coast. Oh. And uh -huh. Chautauqua Lake is one of the stopping areas, stopover areas and feeding areas and resting areas for those birds. I don't see them on, uh, we live near um, the Mayville Conservation Club and 
I've not seen them there often, but I have seen swans once in a great while on that pond, swans. So, um, okay, yeah. So, uh, so it's important for the animals too to yes. have, have the have the clean water. Now. Um, Misconception number three that she has written down here is herbicides will restore the lake to previous conditions. Um, what really happens? Well, we've filled the lake with sediment. Uh, you know, we had watersheds that were forested and they were cleared for farming. And uh, we had a lot of, you know, dairy farming and uh, crop farming that has created much of the lake to have sediments where we had rocky bottom areas have been filled in with mud oh. and uh, so the lake has changed the lake has aged considerably over the last 200 years and so we have a lot more areas that host heavy plant growth than than there was uh, you know 200 years ago mm -hmm. uh, so you really can't turn the clock back on the lake no we can really work hard to try to arrest the soil erosion in the watershed and intercept the nutrients before they get to the lake to try to slow down the aging of the lake. But la lakes naturally age and turn into swamps and then eventually Ew. fill in and uh, become dry land. Oh gosh. And um, you know the southern end of the lake is much shallower. The average depth is about 11 feet. So uh, it's much closer to being a swamp than the northern basin is which oh. has a, a much deeper average depth of uh, you know 30 something feet. Oh, okay. So um, the southern basin is way more is way more um, enriched with nutrients and hosts algae blooms longer during the year and mm -hmm. has worse plant growth problems mm -hmm. because so much of the lake southern basin of the lake is shallow enough for the plants to get enough sunlight to grow. Mm -hmm. Now these nutrients that you talk about, um, what what are what are they composed of? Um, Primarily phosphorus and nitrogen compounds. So nitrogen and phosphorus are the two primary nutrients that drive the plant and algae growth in the lake. And uh, most most of the time, phosphorus is the limiting nutrient. But there are times in the summer that uh, nitrogen as well uh, is limiting as far as algae blooms go. And so it's really important to keep those from going in the lake as much as possible. And you know we have you know many times over increase the levels of those going into the lake each year of uh, you know, fertilizers and nutrients and um, once it's in the lake it's in the lake so mm -hmm. lakes tend to in the summertime release the phosphorus back into the water column which helps fuel the uh, algae problems so you yeah. have the, the load of the nutrients coming in plus that that comes up from the lake bottom so it's really important to use preventive activities to try to really minimize the amount of nutrients making it to the lake because you can never turn the clock back once it's once those things are in there mm -hmm. the phosphorus just, just keeps being released from the sediments oh oh i see and the sediments are like the mud and stuff yes. that that goes in yes okay uh she has for misconception number four herbicides are affordable and will address aquatic plant management needs. Um, let's see. Uh, should agencies in favor of herbicides, herbicide use, be transparent about the cost? Yes, they should be. Uh, herbicides are extremely expensive. Uh, the permitting process and the, the scientific information that needs to be provided is very costly to, to develop. Um, and so, you know, herbicides are a tool that's, that are effective for uh, spot treatment, small areas, um, staying away from sensitive areas, but on a large scale are extremely cost prohibitive. And it has not been proven that they're, that they're uh, more economical than mechanical harvesting in our lake. Yeah, yeah, that's what, it, what the article said. It's, um uh, I was going to ask why are existing harvesting strategies better than herbicides? 
Now that's when they go through the lake with a machine? Yes. And, and it pulls up certain weeds? Well, the, the harvesting actually removes the plants, including the nutrients that are in the plants. Uh, herbicides kill the plants and they decay and they stay in the lake and mm -hmm. release the nutrients to the water column mm -hmm. for algae to grow and mm -hmm. other plants to grow. Mm -hmm. So harvesting actually removes those nutrients from the system. Mm -hmm. Takes them out of the lake so they don't keep recycling through. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, harvesting is um, you're, you're harvesting the areas that you need you need the direct impact from. Uh, herbicides move. Mm -hmm. They the water currents can carry them away from where you apply them and uh, create damage damage the plant community away from the targeted sites. Oh, I wondered about that. I wondered if. Um I wondered if uh, the herbicides could be spread yes, all the way through the lake. It's called drift, and it can cause offsite. It can cause damage to the plant community away from where it's applied. So, um, you know, our organization uh, believes that herbicides should only be used in a very limited area and um, you know under very strictly controlled conditions because our lake. The waters move quite a bit. Um, the water's always moving depending on which way the wind is blowing. And there has been, the chemicals have been documented you know, quite far away from where they were applied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't Harve surprise that's me. That's where harvesting only happens where you harvest. Right, And right. you can target exactly the areas that, that need the, uh, you know, where you have the boat traffic, the heavy boat traffic, where you, where you know you want to have that area cleared. Uh, you can clear it and, um, you, know, you may have to harvest an area three or four times a summer, but you're not you're not killing things, and you're not creating a bare lake bottom that then right. um, that then allows that so the, basically the the bottom of the lake to be moved by wave action and stirred up and cause turbidity and putting more nutrients in the, back into the water column. Mm -hmm. Now I've he heard people talk about. Uh, something called dredging the lake. Uh, do you, what is that? Dredging is where you essentially, in most cases, it's uh, if you think of a snowblower, uh -huh. uh, a snowblower has augers and then they, it, instead of blowing the, the snow out uh -huh. <laughs> onto a snowbank, uh, it's like an underwater snowblower with an auger that cuts through the, cuts through the mud and sends it in a pipe to a barge, and it's taken out and dried and put on the land. Uh, it's extremely expensive. Oh, uh, the okay. county hired engineers to look into this about 10 years ago, and mm -hmm. to do, you know, it may cost, it may cost several million dollars to an area that's only oh. 100 acres in size. Oh wow! So uh, it's really, it's it's viable for like just keeping creek mouths open around the lake. Um, it's not viable, or opening up areas where marinas are, it's not viable to, for instance, to, it would probably cost $5 million to, to dredge 100 or 150 acres of Burtis Bay oh, to wow. get it down to a point where it was, you know, deeper than a foot or two. Oh, wow. So it's, it's, it would, it would, it's extremely cost prohibitive. Mm-hmm. So it's not really something that would be considered then. It's it's done by people who run marinas to make sure their marinas are able to be accessed by their boat traffic. Mm -hmm. So it's it's cost effective and feasible for them for small areas, but not on a large basis. Oh, okay. And the other problem with it is, uh, let's say you're dredging the area out in front of a creek mouth. If you have a hundred year storm flood event, uh, mm -hmm. you could pretty much fill in and just lose your entire investment in you know, one or two or three storms and have, have the area refill in with mud mm -hmm. if you have not controlled the watershed and fixed the watershed above oh, it. So if you okay. don't fix the causes of the sedimentation, you can lose your entire investment very quickly. Oh, okay. okay. So it's really more important to, mm -hmm. to make sure that you're controlling erosion in mm -hmm. the watershed. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we did mention uh, lymphoma in dogs uh, from herbicides, but um, 
by using them in the lake, does this pre present a health hazard to humans? Um, I don't have information on that. I know um, we definitely don't want herbicides anywhere near public water supply intakes. Mm -hmm. uh, so historically, the state has not allowed herbicides up until last year north of, uh, north of the ferry or north of Long Point. Oh, okay. Because of water intakes at Point Chautauqua and at Chautauqua Institution. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the lake is much deeper in the northern basin and there is there are a few areas that really you know that really makes sense to use herbicides on so uh, from public health standpoint and from an ecological standpoint it really is doesn't make a lot of sense to use herbicides north of Long Point mm -hmm. on Chautauqua Lake. Okay I just wondered because um, I know people go swimming in the lake and everything like that you know so I just wondered. Yeah, I can't say that. You know, I would not be want to. I would not want to swim in water that was treated with 2,4-D mm -hmm. uh, at any concentration. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I yeah, I know. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that get into uh, the water that a lot of people don't know about. I mentioned it to you before we uh, started. Um, uh, the, recording the episode, uh, things like um, when people uh, who are getting treated, uh, cancer patients are being treated with chemotherapy drugs, and when they go to the toilet, uh, then chemotherapy uh, drugs actually get... Um, well, yes, pharmaceuticals are a growing problem in our waterways and uh, rivers like the Susquehanna. Uh, the smallmouth bass are having reproductive problems because the male fish are exhibiting female mm -hmm. uh, sexual organs mm -hmm. and um, the, they think it's attributable to, um, to potentially um, you know, hormones being released from people taking hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of women take hormones and you know, hor hormone replacement therapy. Right. Uh, we have a lot of... A lot of um, of chemical pharmaceuticals that behave as um, as hormones, mm -hmm. and that actually is being it's being documented to affect fish and amphibians and, and reptiles exposed to these polluted waters because um, our hormonal hormonal systems and th those of wildlife are so hormones are very strong chemicals and it takes very little for them to actually have an impact on the on mm -hmm. the sexual characteristics mm -hmm. of, of animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, whether or not somebody actually gets chemotherapy treatments for cancer is their decision. However, I don't think the rest of us should be drinking it. No. No, I, <laughs> I, I mean, a lot of people don't know that, you know, the, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of municipal waters are actually water that's already been used and it goes to the sewer treatment plants and then it comes back into the water supply well, and there's all of all, not everything <laughs> the the sewer systems are are not um are were not invented to uh remove all these other things no they're not it was and just you know for poop and pee was according to what sherry mason yes. told us um <laughs> <laughs> was just to remove poop and pee, but um, but then all of those other things can't really be uh, unless they unless they uh, I guess there are new modern things that can be put into uh, these treatment plants, but a lot of places don't have them yet. Yes, um, carbon block filtration. There are carbon filtration systems that can remove more chemicals than. Uh, more standard treatment plants, but uh, yes, everybody, if the, everything that is uh, going down the drain in Mayville is consumed by people all the way to New Orleans, Ooh. down the Ohio <laughs> River into the <laughs> Mississippi and yeah, uh, the city of Pittsburgh and yeah, all the way down, uh, yeah. millions and millions of people downstream from us drink the water that come out of our wastewater treatment plants yeah. around Chautauqua Lake yeah. and Mayville and Celeron and um, 
Jamestown's treatment plant all goes downstream and is consumed by millions of people. So very right, important right. point. I, I don't think a lot of us, it really occurs to a lot of us to think about what happens to that when we flush our toilets, but um, things spread. And the industrial you know. chemicals get more and more concentrated as you go down the Mississippi to the point that the communities that are the farthest down on the Mississippi, um, and I think the communities down there have you know, noticeably higher, alarmingly higher rates of cancer due to the contaminated drinking water that they are taking oh, from the Mississippi. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So um, I like to discourage people from using um, toxic products on their lawns and lawns and things. So I, definitely uh, green is the way to go. Well, we, we try to discourage people from using chemicals on their yards because um, you know, we have a lot of animal neighbors and um, mm -hmm. you know if you want a healthy bird population in your community mm -hmm. uh, you cannot use herbicides and pesticides because that kills the food for the birds mm -hmm. and uh, you know birds have to feed their young caterpillars and uh, you have to have native trees producing lots of food for the for the native uh, moths and butterflies which are then eaten, mm -hmm. eaten mm -hmm. used by the mother and father birds to feed their baby birds. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have uh, chemical free lawn care signs that we make available to people who commit to having uh, chemical free mm -hmm. lawns and mm -hmm. uh, those are available mm -hmm. through our conservationists and mm -hmm. we would encourage everyone to uh, you know, not use chemicals on their, on their lawns. Mm -hmm. Well, I was telling you about the guy uh, that I did an episode with about uh, how mushrooms can save the world. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something that, you know, like uh, when they put those on, uh, when they plant uh, the mycelia on like banks that go down to the streams, uh, the mycelia um, prevent, uh, acts as a filter that prevents mm -hmm. sediment from going down into the water and, and so forth. So that's, that's... And that's that's one of the reasons that old growth forests and old forests are so important because you have an intertwined community of the mycelia and the roots of the trees and they're all working together mm -hmm. in a, symbiotically to, to take the nutrients and use them and get them to the plants that need them and, mm -hmm. and the, the uh, mushrooms and other decomposers are you know, a really important part of that system of recycling all the nutrients in a, in a positive way. And mm -hmm. that's so important as we face climate change to, oh, to keep yeah. forests intact. Oh, yes, definitely. And, you know, these, you know, they're finding that these, the, the mother trees that have been there for 100 years are mm -hmm. feeding the smaller trees. And it's really a quite complex system that, mm -hmm. that most people don't have any idea or oh, appreciate. I know. Yeah, they, they do. They, they feed each other, yes, you, you know, very much the, so. the plants feed each and of other. And of course all the animals in the ecosystem are all dependent on that whole system working properly in right. order for them to, to flourish right, as well. Right. So when you go in and you clear cut a forest, it uh, not only, you're not just taking the trees out, you're, you're destroying a whole, a whole system that took centuries to set up and, and mature in form. Yeah, really. Now I'm thinking that uh, we picked out some pictures, um, some other pictures to show. Oh yeah. Now, uh, John, you are in the very center, the person <laughs> right in the middle of the picture. And who are these other guys? We have Twan Leanders, who is the Conservancy's uh, new ecological restoration manager. Is he the guy in the, uh, he's the yellow on the left? Fluorescent colored vest. Okay. Yes, he's an incredible ecologist. And uh, then we have the, the lights are kind of bright in here. Uh, I believe the second person is uh, Tom Slabe, who is one of our preserve volunteers and part of our conservation team. And then myself, and then then Jeremy Wilson, who is our lands manager, who who is in charge of managing our preserves, and then we have uh, Bob Lannon, who is a former officer of the Conservancy and a longtime member of our conservation committee, who is also a Mayville resident. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, fish, hawks, and steelhead habitat. K 
campaign. We are currently working to conserve lands on Goose Creek and Chautauqua Creek and mm -hmm. other parts of the, the region. Uh, we have probably five or six different landowners that we're working with to conserve their lands. And um, specifically right now we have a campaign to conserve about 57 acres on or near Goose Creek in the Asheville area right across from our from our uh, Loomis Goose Creek Preserve and we have an active osprey mm -hmm. nest on a pole there that you can see from the road. And that's an osprey on the right. The osprey is on the right. And, and a bald eagle on the left. bald eagle is on the left and um, we are working to conserve lands at the mouth of Chautauqua Creek up in Barcelona mm -hmm. which is um, a really interesting spot from an ecological standpoint because uh, a lot of food comes down that creek and makes it a wonderful feeding area for birds like eagles and ospreys to, to perch and to eat the fish that, are, that are, have come down the creek that have passed away. And mm -hmm. uh, it's also a steelhead campaign because Chautauqua Creek is a wonderful, one of the most uh, prolific steelhead fishing areas in um, western New York mm -hmm. and a very popular steelhead fishing area which has a, a very large economic impact on our region. Um, and the community of Westfield. People mm -hmm. come from all over the Northeast and Midwest to fish in Chautauqua Creek. And some of those people can stay for a week or more and uh, you know, it pumps about a million dollars into our local economy each year. So we want to keep that fishery intact by conserving as much of Chautauqua Creek as possible. Oh yeah. Now this is a really beautiful picture. That is at our preserve at, it's the Prendergast, Prendergast Creek Wetlands Preserve. Prendergast. Okay, that's so that, down that's the. That's on Chautauqua Lake. Okay, that's the other side of the Chautauqua Institution away. Yes, it's yeah. south of Chautauqua Institution, and we have actually uh, packaged three or four properties there. Uh, so we have uh, the shoreline from the mouth of Chautauqua Creek at Snug Harbor Marina down to Whitney Point conserved. So we've got about uh, about. Let's see, I think about eight acres conserved there and um, you know, over a thousand feet of lakeshore conserved. And that's one of the most, that's one of the most uh, diverse plant communities on that lake, on the lake there and one of the largest wetlands on the lake and really an important uh, nursery area for a variety of game fish. Okay, we have two people in a boat. <laughs> Who are they? Uh, I believe, I, the person in front is Michelle Foster, who was an intern for the Conservancy several years ago. Um, and we were on Casadega Creek. Oh, Casadega Creek. I think that's Creek. me in the back. Okay. We were, we were on uh, Casadega Creek at our Casadega Creek Wetland Preserve, which was, is 150 acres uh, near Sinclairville. Oh, that's okay. That's our largest preserve. Okay. Well, it, the scenery there is really beautiful, obviously. And what's going on here? Becky Nystrom is sh showing people a salamander or something that uh, that was found on the on the ground. Oh, okay. <laughs> so she's showing something of interest there on one of our one of our many tours. Yeah, and this must be on Chautauqua Lake. Isn't yes, it? Okay. Um, that's that was a site that. Um, was an undeveloped site uh, in the Asheville Bay area. One of the few remaining undeveloped sites that's not conserved. This is, this is a beautiful hillside uh, in Victoria that's uh, one of the wild areas that has really wonderful waterfront vegetation growing in it that's a very popular smallmouth bass fishing spot. And this is the, this is the Stowe Farm Lakeshore waterfront, which is a state wildlife management area and state access point now. Uh, the Conservancy pre-acquired that uh, in 2012. We worked with the state of New York to purchase that from the Stowe family and um, it's I think about 1,400 feet of lakefront and I think about 18 acres of lakeshore wetlands and some very large willow trees that provide a lot of good habitat for uh, all kinds of things to live there under them and in them. Okay. That's the Cheney Farm Lakeshore, which we worked with the state of New York to conserve over 10 years. And there's six tenths of a mile of shoreline that's conserved there that's open to the public for fishing and hiking. 
And um, you know that that um, one thing our organization has been has managed to do is leveraged. We've leveraged about eight million dollars of investment in Chautauqua County for open space and outdoor recreation um, activities. So people who donate to the conservancy, we've leveraged those donations with uh, that's a larger with a lot of state investment in keeping the lake enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So that's a larger, that's a wider screen shot of the Cheney Farm Lakeshore with oh, the yeah. rest area above it. And that is, I believe is Prendergast, the, actually I think that's the Chautauqua Lake outlet where we have uh, eight tenths of a mile of shoreline conserved and about 80, 85 acres of land um, just as the lake reaches the Shadowcoin River. And there's a lot of trees. <laughs> <laughs> That's Dobbins Woods. That's our first preserve, and uh, that was a uh, that was planted by the uh, a previous owner. Um, Mr. Dobbins was a state forester, and he planted his land in uh, with lots of uh, Scots pine and, and other trees, which uh, were planted, and um, those trees are dying out and are being replaced by hardwoods. So the the forest is succeeding back to a hardwood forest from uh, the tree plantation that the forester planted back in the 1940s or 1950s. Okay, and here's a group of people at Dobbins Woods. That was our first preserve, and uh, that picture just before that was this area, and uh, that was that picture was taken probably in about 1995. Oh, oh <laughs> or wow, 1996. that was a while ago, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And that is one of our most popular preserves. It has, uh, has two loop trails within it. And uh, we have had over 3,000 people visit our preserves in the last year. Wow. And just, just uh, wow. we have eight preserves that are improved for hiking. And um, you know, I really encourage people to get out there and enjoy them. Uh, don't, don't recommend going out there for the next week at the end of the gun hunting season oh, because no. Oh, no. Um, some of our preserves are open to hunting and some, oh, they are? Oh, and some are not. But um, for everyone to be safe, uh, if you're out, out of preserves, uh, you should wear bright orange or bright pink yeah, that's, clothing. Yeah, that's uh, what I've been hearing. Yep, because yep. Uh, someone could be hunting on some of them and people are hunting nearby on the neighboring properties. Oh, right, so right. The gun season ends next Saturday, I believe, so. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Well, um, you wanted to um, mention some of the things that you brought with you and uh, you wanted to let uh, uh, people know how they could get a hold of you and, and uh, help to support you and so sure. forth. But we, a lot of our, half of our land that we own has been donated to us by property owners who want to conserve their land permanently. Mm -hmm. So that's very important to us. And uh, we are a membership-based organization. Most of our funding comes from donations from individuals and families. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not a government agency, so we rely on donations and grants to mm -hmm. undertake our conservation activities. And if people would like you know, ideas on managing their land or protecting their land or improving their yards for birds or water quality protection, they can call our office and ask for our conservationists at 664-2166. Uh, that gets you to our phone number. Um, where there's a menu. <laughs> where there's a menu. The uh, best thing is to go online and, uh -huh. uh, and, and you know, probably uh, email us. Uh, but you can call and if you just dial um, if, if you just dial 1001, uh, you'll, get, you'll get our uh, outreach assistant who can then uh, have the right person contact you after your, oh, after oh, your phone call. Oh, I see, call. okay. But um, we, um, you know, we are a membership organization and uh, we encourage people to make donations to the Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy, which can be done online through our website. Just look up our name and put it in your computer. Or uh, we're located at at uh, 71 East Fairmont Avenue, right next to Lakewood Furniture Galleries, and donations can be made in person during the work days. Uh, it's, it's good to call and make sure somebody's there, because uh, sometimes we're out in the field and not, uh, not most of the time someone's there, but, um, and you can call our phone numbers and uh, make, donation, make a donation over the phone as well. So uh, 
we really encourage people to support this work and we thank all the people. We, uh, we have probably about a thousand donors, a thousand mm -hmm. families and businesses that support us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are very thankful for all the people who've uh, supported the Conservancy over the last 30 years and continue to allow us to increase the impact of our conservation activities. Well, it's a really important organization. Um, you get newsletters too. Yes, you have newsletters. You can sign up at our website to get our to get our newsletter, which is the uh, the shed sheet, mm -hmm. and uh, that goes out about three times a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have another one at the printer right now being produced, and that talks about all the activities we're doing uh, that we have underway and um, provides tips on how to keep our lakes and streams clean and how to keep our habitats healthy for our wildlife that we so enjoy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really important for the future, uh, for the future to really preserve everything, uh, the environment. We are working to identify the most important sites in the Chautauqua Lake watershed and countywide to conserve. And, um, you know, we've got, we've conserved 1,100 acres so far and uh, we hope to substantially increase the rate at which we're able to work with landowners to voluntarily conserve their properties and uh, you know we are actively working on how to best determine which sites are more important to protect water quality and protect the habitats to maintain the wildlife of our region going into the future. Yeah, yeah it's really important. Uh, it's really really important. We've got like one minute left if there's any uh, little bit of information you want to get out there still? Um, you know, we are actively working on uh, our, our um, fish hawks and steelhead campaign. And, fish hawks uh, and steelhead. Yes, to conserve the lands on Goose Creek and uh, Chautauqua Creek. And, uh, you know, we would encourage anybody who has questions about that to, to call our office and, um, you know, you can dial uh, you know our extension of our uh, conservationist at uh, our, our talk to our uh, development director um, who's Whitney Gleason oh uh, Whitney you can Gleason. ask for Whitney and um, or myself and we'd love to have people involved in that campaign or people just supporting us in general so strongly encourage you to go to our website and learn more about what we do and uh, you know make a donation toward our organization and uh, support these important efforts. Okay, well, we've come to the end of another episode of Fresh Perspectives, and I wanna thank you again for having appeared on Fresh Perspectives this, this morning, and I hope that we can get you to come on again sometime. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I hope that myself and other staff can join you in the spring and talk some oh, more about I our lakescapes so. programs I hope and other so. Programs. I'm really looking forward to interviewing Miss Carol Markham. And I'll see the rest of you in the viewing audience on the next episode. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.